This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 33, IPv6. Who, what, when, where, how, why. Is running out of space. And because it comes with down to the Goldilocks problem of class C being too small and class A being too big and class B being just right, and they try to aggregate, aggregating like sticking together blocks of class C and then have the router route it together, classless interdomain routing. But that's only a temporary fix because our routing tables are getting smaller. Yeah. IPv5. Yes, actually, that's I think on the next page. Yeah, that's on the next page. Yes, there was. IPv5 was a, actually it's in use, it's a stream transport protocol made by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. That's what uh, makes most of the protocols. But IPv5 is out there, so they called it IPv6. Actually, competing proposals were IPv7, 8, and 9. And uh, so I don't know what the next one will be, but... They had uh, the routing tables were getting too big and too complex to try to route all these things because everybody wanted a class B address. We have more than 256 machines, we want a class B address. So we need, the other thing, why do we need a new version of the protocol is we need address renumbering. They decided, the IETF and some other people were figuring that we needed address renumbering. Whenever we moved from one provider to another, we'd have to renumber all of our addresses and nobody wanted to do that manually anymore. In the original days, it was all set up, the routing tables was just manually entered into the computer in the Unix boxes. But they, uh, the mobility of the computers and the computers are switching from one to another. I mean, my, my Palm Pilot has an IPv4 stack. You know, everything is getting more and more connected to the internet, your dishwasher, you know, your microwaves on the internet. But they decided to, that they needed more and more stuff and to renumber the addresses. We needed to get real-time traffic because in order to get real-time traffic, say I wanted to get video on demand, I could just go and start watching Terminator 2 over the internet and I want it not to lag every, every time. I mean, real audio and real video is bad enough. We needed some auto configuration, meaning that we wanted to be able to take a computer out of the box, plug it in the wall, and have it automatically figure out where it is, who its neighbors are, where its routers are, the nearest router, etc. And of course, why we're all here is they needed more security. Currently right now, IPsec or IP security, which is about the last half of the talk here, is on IP security in general. Uh, they needed to add that in, so they put it as a mandatory feature. So what, is, so what is it? As I said, it's a complete overhaul. They didn't just extend it. They completely redid the headers. They, they're working on TCP v6, etc. It started in 1992 through the IETF process. Uh, other protocols were developed. Proposals were sent out. You know, the standard protocol development of IETF.org. They wanted to have a larger address space, obviously because of this, because they wanted to be able to waste some space in order to make our routing tables easier. So they, they didn't, right now you've got to have everything just right on the, uh, the classes and they wanted to make sure the mobility, they've got mobile IP for V6. Uh, the different traffic classes, FTP, email bulk versus, for example, like real-time video. They wanted to make sure security, or at least authentication, was, was part of everything available. But you wanted to make sure that IPv4, there wasn't a, uh, a, a day in which, all right, at once, we're going to all convert over to IPv6. You can't have that. So we've got to have some way to transition, and I'll talk about transitioning. Okay, addresses. No longer the uh, 128.173.1.5. We now have, instead of 32-bit addresses, we're now going to 128-bit addresses. Ooh. Eight 16-bit groups separated by colons. So that is a fully qualified internet address with, uh, well, obviously made up, but that's how long these addresses are going to be. What's that, what? Binary. One 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 zero zero. Okay. 
So they needed to have shortcuts, so they, they were able, like if you have a bunch of zeros, you could squish it and drop off some of the, the leading zeros and have double colons and other such like that. But for, for the most part, people don't need to know where addresses are. I mean, unless you're doing promiscuous mode and want to find out who's doing what, but they, they wanted to put more emphasis on the domain name servers, which are also going to be changed because you can't have, and that'll be discussed later, you can't just have a a, a record, a, a address resource record. Okay, so some hosts can have more than one interface. Before, it's like I have an IP address, there's my box. I have another IP address, here's my other box. Now, mobility can be, we can have a box connected to multiple providers. We can have a site that's connected to MCI and Sprint. So when Sprint goes down, MCI can take over without having to renumber stuff. We can add mobility. So if I move from Virginia out to here, it's automatically renumbered and I don't have to try to retype in the thing. In fact, even on campus, moving from one building to another, moving from one subnet to another requires a renumbering manually, going through and even rebooting the machine if it's Windows sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> the boundaries are no longer fixed. We have uh, what we call prefixes. So you see right there, the uh, 3FFE 0900 colon colon and then a bunch of zeros out, slash 24. And that means the first 24 bits, or F 3FFE 09, is the prefix, kind of like your, your uh, subnet address. But that's, and I'll show a picture of how the routing will actually work. Since the addresses can be renumbered, everybody has a lifetime of addresses. There's an address how long it's valid for and how long it's preferred for. So that addresses can be renumbered if, for whatever reason. So about 136 years maximum or infinity, and you can and you renumber it uh, a preferred address time before the new one is sought. But they'll have different ones so that you'll know when to renumber. Now, you'll need to know that uh, um, they've been divided up into a couple of, uh, of categories. So why, why did they choose 128 bits and not say 64 bits? Because right now it's 32, we just numbered. I mean, 2 to 64 is an astronomical number. In fact, 2 to the 28, I think is about 6.7 times 10 to the 23rd addresses per square meter of the Earth's surface. <laughs> That's a lot. I mean, if you heard Bruce's talk yesterday, 2 to the 128 is, you know, almost uncountable. So why would we need 6.7 times 10 to the 23rd addresses per square meter? Because of routing inefficiencies. It's more effective to have the router wasting ad blocks of addresses in order to get our router tables easier and faster. So let me show you how they calculated 128 bits. Okay, so this is the only formula in the talk, but Dr. Christian Hutima, who is a uh, highly respected member of the IETF and the IESG, the Internet Engineering Steering Group, developed this H, uh, this H number, and he said the log of the number of addresses over the number of bits is your percent efficiency. So if we have uh, 10 bits in 1,024 in hosts, about 0 0.30, if you take the log of 1024 and divide it by 10, I, this should be right. I want to make sure. So they've, they've estimated it by looking at large networks in IPv4 right now, the way it is, that H is between 0.22 and 0.26. Well, if H is 0.22 to 0.26 and only 32 bits in IPv4, somewhere between 11 and 208 million hosts, if we had uh, the perfect efficiency. Now, what they want to do is they want to connect everybody around the world to IP. They want to have a computer for every person on the planet, soon will be at 10 billion people, you know, in each of those. Up to 100,000 computers if they wanted to have, you know, with their everything else on there, and who knows for, there's, you know, there's objects that aren't with people. So they calculated that out in somewhere between 57 and 68 bits. So instead of limiting themselves to 64 bits, they went to 128 bits. So, and Uni let me explain some new concepts to you. Unicast we've seen, that's from one to one. Uni being one. It goes from one interface to another. It's a standard addressing that we use right now. Multicast we've seen right now. That's one to multiple interfaces. This is a class D address in IPv4. There is no broadcast anymore in IPv6 when it comes around. But they developed any cast. So if I'm sitting at my site, in Kansas, I want to find out where the nearest machine is to a group of similar machines. So if I want to find where CNN is, 
CNN may have a site in Atlanta and London and Moscow, but my computer needs to know where the nearest one is. So what it does is it just searches out through the router table a ring at a time until it finds the nearest server. And you can, it's a, a new feature in IPv6 called AnyCast. So basically any machine within a certain group of machines will be found. Let's talk about some link local, site local, and global addresses, and then I'll actually uh, show you in the next, next couple slides what an address, how it will be broken up. So link local, all machines are on, if I just had an Ethernet segment and I wanted to have all the machines on there, that would be called link local machines. They're not connected to the Internet. They're kind of like your uh, 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 machines for the Class A and other ones. You just set it out of the box and away it goes. They have site local, obviously global, but they have site local where you'd have different addresses for a group of machines that are just called site. Now what's a site? Is it a single campus or is it a company that's spread out over the world and call it a site? So they, there's different addresses that are laid out. And the next slide, let me show you the different percentage of addresses. And you can see the inefficiency and for future expansion. Because right now, the way they've allocated it, global unicast, which is from one to one through the global, is one-eighth of the address space. That's it. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest chunks. The other biggest chunk is geographic-based unicast, which is based off of GPS or any other kind of address that's based on where the machine is. They got things in here for IPX, multicast addresses, link local, which is what I said on a particular link site local and others. And that accounts for about 30% of the address space. And that includes every single global unicast. So another 70% of addresses is not assigned. So theoretically you could uh, you know, branch this off into space at some point and maybe have IP on other planets or the moon and stuff like that and they'll still work. IPV yeah, out there. So let me show you what a different... The global unicast address is kind of like the common one, which is what most people use. I took 128 bits and divided it up into... There's the three bit... Well, I didn't, but the IETF divided it into format prefix, which is the third... There's three bits on the left down there, which kind of tells whether it's a global-based machine or an IPX, something like that. You got TLAs, NLAs, SLAs, and the interface ID. Now the TLA is kind of like the, the overall global providers, while the, while the NLA is for particular sites. So like a TLA would be something like Sprint, and an NLA aggregator, that's top level aggregator, next level aggregator, and site level aggregator. Um, the next level aggregator could be university, and then each university can, instead of giving out little subnets of 256 or 1,024 bits each, each university is given a fixed format prefix, a fixed TLA, and a fixed NLA so that each university can give out SLAs any way they want to. Well, that's 16 bits right in there that they can give out per network, so up to 65,000 networks per every site. Now, the interface ID is you take the Ethernet card and you run through some e IEEE shifting around. You basically take your MAC address, split it apart, put some stuff, put a couple bits in the middle, FFF, E, and zeros in there, flip a couple bits, and you'll come up with your interface address. So that's how the, uh, your addresses are calculated, basically off of your MAC address, since most people now have Ethernet. But if not, there's other ways of getting to 64 bit. So the 64 bits just for a machine, much less in the site and all that. Let me show you. Let me show you now the header. Our old IP header is gone. They still have the version number where it's supposed to be, but now they've got uh, some different, different things in there. We have flows and priorities and class. Priority used to be class and flow label. That's like saying every frame of Terminator 2 will have a unique flow label. So you can know like what frame is coming through and you'll know that this is a Terminator 2 film that's going to this address, needs real-time video so that the routers can go through there, see the header, figure out that it's real-time traffic, not even have to look at the whole packet and send it on. So just with a few
few bits, and everything is fixed. There's, you can notice that there's no IP options anymore. I, and I'll cover how those are covered, but there's no IP options. It's a way that they just stick it all in there. Payload length, you can have up to 64K in a packet. However, there's ways of getting, getting more in there. Next header is kind of like in the IP. It says, you know, here, the next header is TCP. Hop limit is not time to live because people, hop limit is you decrement one every time you go through a router because you used to have time to live and no longer are routers one, you know, every router takes less than a second. No router takes three seconds. Because TTL used to be the number of seconds that it was at a router. And there's your source and destination bits. But let me show you in, Yep, there you go. Payload length is 16 bits, but if you put the length to zero, you can have something called a jumbo gram. Four gigabyte packets. Oh, yeah. Now, because over fiber, and, and whether well, it's going toward that, it makes more efficiency to send larger packets. So they allow for jumbo grams. The minimum MTU is uh, 1280 bytes, and uh, but I, they, they haven't really addressed this. But I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm not really sure what a ping of death would be with a jumbo gram of four gigs. <laughs> that would be something. I don't know whether it's just like you know, well, it's coming, it's coming, and they, you know, that's the kind of that's the kind of vision they see. But you know, from a security point of view, I'm kind of wondering. Well, it's legal to send a four gig packet, but that's a serious uh, mail bomb or a packet bomb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't drop those packets and. Type of header, there's different, instead of using options, they've got headers for authentication and ESP and stuff like that, fragment and destination, so that every packet doesn't have to be looked at until the end. They can just, if they want a hop by hop header, they could, but for instance, using a fixed size header without the options and no fragmentation, if you need fragmentation, you stick a fragment header. There's no fragmentation, they can, you allow it, but for the most part, they won't have it, so you don't have to look at the fragmentation. So the browser will be at least 40% faster in with just a fixed size header in experiments that have been done. Header chaining, you've seen this, you know, you stick an IPv4 and then a TCP and away you go. IPv6 will stick, next header is routing, the router header will say it's TCP, or the next header is routing, which will then say it's a fragment, the next thing is a fragment, will say authentication, the next thing is an ESP, and it just, you just chain the headers straight on down. This is ripped out of RFC 1883. Let me show you about routing. In routing, you have, if I'm at router X, we have variable length subnet masks. So now, you know, it's, your, your classes are A, B, and C, and everything is kind of laid out. Your routers are laid out with, they find the longest prefix. So remember that slash 24, what that means? That means that the first 24 bits of the 128 bits is your prefix header. So it's going to say prefix 1 and router 1, router 2, router 3, and router 4. Here's two examples on the bottom. If I have an IPv6 address, 3 FFE 900, 1, 111, 269, whatever else, what happens, as you can see with the bold, is it will take the first, the router will say, well, here, let me show you over here. Those who didn't hear that, that the uh, one router one will be taken because it matches only up to the 24 bits, and so the longer the way down the chain, the more easy it'll be to get to the router. So that the longer addresses will go there, and that's what's called variable length subnet masks. So any network can have any number of you could have a slash 24 slash 25 for the, uh, any number of bits. And so you can see how your networks can be completely aggregated or stuck together. Mobility, one of my uh, favorite topics, the ability to move from one to another. We've got 
mobile IPv6, which is IP for mobility. They've actually got mobile IPv4. They've done experiments on it. They've got mobile ad hoc networks where a bunch of us get together with our laptops and turn them on and with infrared wireless links, we now have a, a system set up to play whatever game we're playing just by turning it on. The computer should be able to, that's what they want to do, you should be able to turn it on and have everybody see who's out there and go from there. But not just in a room, but anywhere. So I, if, there is a, if there is a router port or a network access point in the corner, I should be able to turn on my machine, it should be able to say, wait, there's a wireless link in the corner. Your, my IP address is this, my nearest router is this, and automatically configure the computer to go with that. My concern is, while I went to an IETF meeting in Washington, D.C. once, and they kind of like, well, well, we'll put off security toward later. And that's what really uh, concerns me, is these same attacks have been coming over and over, and you know that this is going to be a problem. But for mobility, they've got address space now to move around. You don't have to keep just one IP address. You could have any number of IP addresses. And anything can be on the internet now. Co-located means that it's going to another place through uh, agents. Uh, neighbor discoveries, what I talked about there, about being able to just turn it on, figure out what the prefix is, what the MTU, ma maximum minimum transfer unit is, or maximum transfer unit, figure out the hop length. Duplicate address detection, you know, is my box already out there? Does somebody already have my IP number or not? And uh, stuff like that. So I've kind of I've kind of answered the questions of what it is, and now I try to figure out well who's who's using it. You know, I like my IPv4. I don't care, but you know, right now it is in universities. It is in research institutions. People are starting to come around to, to testing this out. And I'll go through later what the mechanism is, how you're going to transfer over, what the plan is. There are IPv6 stacks out there for Unix. And Windows 2000, they, yeah, they, they had said at one point, they wanted, does anybody know whether they'll be in there or not? No, uh, yeah. I, I don't know, but that's, it, it's, they're trying to establish it in there. In fact, one of the ways to get transition is to use dual stacks, dual IP stacks. But that's on the next slide. So there's a couple ways. How would we transfer this over? How would it work? Well, there's the six bone, which is similar to the M bone, the multicast backbone. If you hop on and you want to see NASA's space shuttle downlink, you can get an address on, uh, on the M bone and go through that. But they've got different islands of IPv6. You know, University A has an IPv6 network. University B has an IPv6 network. And they want to talk to each other over the global IPv4. So they use, through the IPv4C, they connect it through gateways, which translate IPv6 to IPv4, you know, unwraps the packets and packs it back up and sends it across. You can either have dual stacks, which are one machine, you have uh, two different stacks to handle the packets. You know, if an IPv4 packet comes in, it knows that. If it's an IPv6 packet, it goes with that. Or you could have tunneling, which they place one packet inside of another. Just like you encapsulate the TCP inside of an IP, you encapsulate an IPv4 packet inside of an IPv6 packet. Uh, this can be done, but it's inefficient because now, if you've got, if uh, the only way I can reach my the other IPv6 is through these sets of tunnels, where it may just be the machine right next door, and I may have to go all the way around the internet to find my next door machine. It's inefficient, but they're trying to uh, put it together. Okay, well that's that's a general overview of IPv6, and I'll come into more detail later. But let's switch gears here and talk about DEF CON's about security. Security for IP. Now, IP security, some haven't heard of it, IPsec. They've got different headers, different, uh, you, you have an authentication header and an encapsulating security payload. Actually, this will work for IPv4 as well. But for IPv6, authentication is required for every transaction except when you put in like a, a null authentication, which I didn't figure that one out. But they put uh, security associations and tells which, you know, this machine is using DES to talk to this connection. This machine, you know, we're using IDEA to talk to this machine. And Bellevin wrote a paper a couple years ago which, which goes through, and they fixed a lot of the problems that he mentions, but problem areas for the IP security protocols and the references in, is in the back. 
but the IETF had IPSEC working on it. RFC 1825, uh, 1826, and 1827, various crypto techniques to put it in there. You can use, uh, the reason why they have, you may ask, why didn't they just have a crypto header? The reason why is because when they developed this, some countries would allow authentication. You know, I am really Dr. Byte coming from Las Vegas. They wouldn't allow encryption through their country. So you could have it so that people could just use authentication, or you could use authentication and encryption, or you could just use encryption. But that's, that's why the selected use of it. A little bit about the authentication header, go read Atkinson's uh, RFC. Basically, they, a base level is MD5. But you can add other stuff in there. They've got, for those security associations, you could say, well, I'm using you know, this type of authentication protocol or even a new protocol has been developed, and you just stick it right in there. I'll show you the header format in, the next, in a note later slide. DES is the uh, CBC, is the ESP-based thing, but we can stick in any other kind of, uh, of, enca of encryption on there. So this is the header format at, ripped out of the RFC where everything is based off of header chaining. The next header is this, that, and the other. There's a listing, well, it was through IANA, uh, the Internet Assigned Number Authority, but now it's gone up. Postel has passed away, so they shifted it over to somebody else. But there's different things, the length of the header. Uh, the different types of authentication. Your index is basically a 32-bit number as to like this machine, you know, you can have up to, I guess, 4 billion connections that says, you know, connection number one has got this type of authentication header so it knows which connection is going to which machines. That's one thing, host-based authentication versus uh, user-based authentication. If I have a host-based authentication where my machines are talking to each other, then there's lots of attacks you can do, and Belvin describes those in his paper. Dr. Belvin describes how you can, if you're using the same key for everybody on the same host, then there's attacks that can be done. But for the most part, that's the AH or authentication header, which is used in anything. It's coming along. Our ESP or encapsulating security payload is done with just another security association and uh, just various sets of data in here that may have keys and other such stuff. I have a feeling I, I forgot to put in the, uh, the next header chain, but for the most part, that's that. So what is this security association that I keep talking about? The security association is what kind of security are we going to have for this connection? Let's make like a record or a structure or whatever else you want to call it, an aggregate of different data that says what security we're going to use, what authentication method, what authentication keys, which encryption method are we going to use, and which encryption keys are we going to use, initialization vectors on, uh, on various crypto, how long the key should last, et cetera. And there's an index into the database of different security associations that determine which things are in there through a, a table lookup. And you can use different ones for different connections and different machines and different sessions and other such stuff like that. Bellevin, I, I, here's some of the, there's two pages of, two slides of, I summarized Bellevin's paper, which was a, a great paper where he listed, you know, the ESP provides a, a confidentiality, and the authentication provides authentication integrity and non-repudiation. You know, like, I didn't send that stock certificate. No, it's failures, uh, we need to have... He pointed out there was failures. You could have encryption broken. You could have spoofing attacks. You could read encrypted data because if you send a, you know, a telnet session is one character at a time, so you encapsulate one, one character in a packet. So if you know if it's the same host key, if everybody's using the same keys, go back and forth with different initialization vectors. He says fragmentation attacks. If, if you haven't read. Uh, 
Tom, Tom tax paper on uh, evasion and insertion of tax. I think it's through NAI. Uh, that's firewalls can be brought around through fragmentation attack. We can use fragmentation attack and ruin about everything. Session hijacking. All these problems. I mean, IPsec is supposed to solve all these, but there's still plenty of thing out there. But for defense, let's let's see how we're going to help solve some of this. You know, we want to have. You, you don't want to have just encryption without integrity because you can change anything in there and read it. You want to have per user. You want to have different keys per that. You don't want to have. You want a, a, just a general overall attack that people use sometimes is they will they'll take they'll send them a plain text and they'll encrypt something and back like give an error message or you'll send something in cipher text and they'll send it back in plain they'll send an error message in plain text you want to have because then that helps you with the cryptanalysis which is not my expertise but um, plain text to plain text and cipher text to cipher text that's what you want to do. DNS, I'll talk about DNS later because that's going to have to be changed with all this. It'll be have to be added on. No longer will you be able to send an IP address and get back a 32-bit number. DNS security, there's a separate working group, DNS sec on that, where your DNS stuff will be that. And that's, that's some neat stuff to be able to try to uh, hose your DNS servers. Okay, so in, in summary, for IPsec, that is, the uh, we have the IETF has standards coming out. IPsec has been around. You can do that. You can split the headers for restricted countries. Like I was saying, if you just want authentication, sometime now this my main when I went to IETF, they it's a catch-all for all other things. We'll just stick IPsec on there, or we'll figure out security later. Let me just design a protocol, a routing protocol, or a mobile protocol, and you know that that would work. But we're sticking security on as an afterthought, and you can't do that. You cannot stick security on as an afterthought. You've got to build it in. You know, when the internet was developed, security was an afterthought, and look where that's leading us. They're, so they're trying to say authentication header for everything. You know, go with that. There's the key distribution protocols. How do we do key exchanges? You know, if everybody's doing authentication, now there's keys flying everywhere. If there's keys flying everywhere, how do you distribute this through 128 bits and, and many places out there? These problems have been, some have been fixed, but every new protocol is going to have problems. And they'll come out with it at some point. All right, by where IPv6, where you know, where's the uh, support? Where's the beef here? The we're now having a new resource record in DNS. If you're not familiar with DNS, there's A records for addresses and H info and other such stuff. Go read the RFC. But they're going to return quad A records for 128 bits because their addresses are now four times as long. And for reverse lookup, there's a. Uh, that's how you get uh, the, the name from the number. IPv6.int IP domain classes. There are different domain classes to go backwards. It's kind of the same thing we did, but the new domain class. DNS, you know, I said something about renumbering, where if I go from there to here, from the East Coast to the West Coast, it's, you know, I get a new IP number. DNS needs to know now where my new number is so that if anybody wants to send me addresses, if I have a mail server set up, it needs to know where to send it. So DNS needs to know where the new renumbering is. And DNS needs to be renumbered. So they're working on DNS. There's the IPNG working group is in the IETF and they've set out all these RFCs and if you go to IETF.org and look through them, that's actually where the internet, if anybody doesn't realize, that's where the internet protocols are developed. That people from all over get together and they, they get in working groups, it's a volunteer organization and if you're interested in a certain protocol, you follow their mailing list, they have discussions and they have uh, meetings about three times a year and they discuss these protocols and if uh, rough uh, working code and rough consensus 
is uh, they try to get the code work two different implementations, and that's how protocols are developed. That's how the new IPv6 is going to be developed. So if you have any problems with protocols or want to get involved in it, just go to ietf.org and, uh, and check it out. But people are putting it into place. Site operators are putting it into place uh, at different universities. They've got IPv6 network within the university. So you're able to, to tack in and have islands. And it's starting, to, it's starting to come around. It's a very flexible protocol. But things still need to come around. There's still problems out there. But what happens if we have a socket and all of a sudden the machine go, changes addresses? Well, that, that's, that's a problem. The address renumbering, hopefully, it will be able, that's why you have, it's kind of like when, when they first created stoplights, they had red and green, and that was it. And so we would go, and all of a sudden, boom, it would turn red, and people would have tons of accidents. So they said, well, we should have a yellow light, so we could you know, have that kind of the tri-level buffer. So the same kind of thing here with the, with the preferred length of how long it's going to be around versus valid. So you know, you know I'm, pa I'm past the time. This thing is going to renumber soon. I need to renumber soon. Here's another problem. One of those colons, if you ever do different addresses in the HTTP, then you go, well, here's my, you know, CNN.com colon port 1026 for a new protocol in there or a new, a new page or whatever. How does it know where to parse it? So they're still working on stuff like that. I'm not... So there's plenty of... Uh, because right there, I intended the address to be 3 FFE 2800 all the way down to A and port 8080. But yeah, you could probably pick the last colon, but then if you try, well, if you work to the last colon, then if the address like that was supposed to be 3 FFE 2800 A colon 8080, then it wouldn't be able to tell which, which it is. Huh? Differentiating character. I don't know how they're solving that, but I'm just that's just a general problems and they're still they're still working on stuff. I have no idea. People decided that they wanted colons, I guess, in the IETF and they they went with that. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it could. You, just different ways of addressing, and I don't know why they did that, but I'm, you know, that's, that's the way it's done with uh, with different addresses. The MAC address is also colons. Well, the MAC address, you actually just take it and they split it apart and stick it in there. And the MAC has colons, but it's like six. Uh, six bits, or no, six different sections of eight bits each, you know, six different bytes, and they flip that apart. I don't know whether they did that or not, or whether they like colons, or whether they're going to change it to a different separator, put semicolons, or backslashes, or whatever. You know, why didn't we just keep, uh, why did MS-DOS put backslashes instead of slashes? I mean, you know, we'll come around to figuring out a way to get around these things. But there's still problems that are still out there. But when is it coming? I mean, people ask me, it's like, well, IPv6 will never make it because there's IPv4 and none of the, none of the, uh, the NOCs will want to switch and none of the IPs, ISPs will want to switch. But when the, uh, whatever the new IANA is, says, sorry, you can't get any more IP addresses, deal with it, and people want more servers, and they start putting everything on the internet, from the Palm Pilots to, to your microwaves to the dishwashers, that, you know, you're going to run out of addresses, and something is going to break soon. Yeah. So, network address translation will be able to that problem? Network address translating for those is the ability to stick a box on your site and say, Okay, coming in here, this looks like one big machine. But when you come in, it switches the addresses and figures out, well, actually, it's going to the mail server here, or it's going to this one right here. And when you call out, the NAT knows that box A in this site is talking to somewhere over here. So when it comes back in, it knows the same session of the packet and knows to go back to A versus B versus C. Yes, that's doable, and that's one of the midterm solutions. But first of all, if you have a site, you're now creating a bottleneck unless you stick multiple NATs. If you stick multiple NATs, and there's a problem of which side it comes in and how do you route it back, so you start getting bottlenecks into the NATs. 
and uh, so that becomes a problem. Uh, I've read a few a few papers, did a report on that um, last year. They're neat, and they're you know because if you're only given one IP address, you can try to make that out, but you know it'll it's a temporary solution. Yeah. Sometimes it does. Yeah, I mean it's just it's a temporary hack, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. Yeah. Okay, the question was, should I download IPv6 now and play with it? And the second question was, is it going to be compatible with anonymous service like Freedom? Um, you could probably play with it now through dual stacks. Um, there's, I think Linux has got one, and they've they've started to put in different types of stacks. Yeah, play with it. You might want to do that. I'm not sure whether, you know, I'm not familiar. I haven't played around with the Freedom sites, but they uh, they may be, they may not. I'm not sure. But they they've got it they've got it here now. But people are like, well. You know, I'm not going to change, you know, I'm not going to write an IPv6 stack for my VAX, which is sitting on the internet right now. And so IPv4 will eventually, not, IPv4 will always be around. There will always be legacy systems. That's why Microsoft Windows is so lousy, because they have to keep taking in everything from the past. That's why Intel architectures have to carry baggage from 1978 you know, when they created the first the first stuff and they just kind of keep adding it on backwards compatibility that's the mantra for the computing world is backwards compatibility so I don't think I, IPv4 is not going to go away but they want to try to shift it over to IPv6 as a primary so then IPv4 will be using these gateways and tunnels and it will be slower but it will still be useful and then there's different addresses, which I didn't do in here, but there's there's ways of putting addresses like you know FFFF calling in the address in front of your IPv4 in order to make it an IPv6 address and, and other stuff like that, which you're using to kind of transform it over so that eventually you can get an IPv6 address. I mean I've I've had IPv6 addresses for boxes and IPv4. So yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, you next. Good. The question is, is whether a NAT or IP masquerading on Linux or a NAT box is able to convert one address to another. I played a little bit around with it, but I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Now, technically, there should be a problem. Technically, there should be a problem. Yeah, I mean, you can code it. Well, you can convert it over. You can write the stuff to convert it. As long as you know, because you got to have the right headers and the right addresses, you probably could, but I, I don't know. I was like, yeah. Oh, okay. With, with Linux and BSD, the open BSD, you can do it. So it's probably, it's coming, it's out there. And because they, you know, pe people wonder when IPv4 is going to go, is going to run out of addresses. I mean, about 4.2 billion addresses. Now, obviously, you can't have perfect because if you have a Class A network, if you don't have 16.7 computers, but only even 8 million computers on a Class A network, then another 8 million addresses is wasted. And you keep doing that, and the internet is going to be broken up into different chunks. So they, you know, you can. It's gonna, they estimate somewhere between 2005 and 2015, this was like a year or two ago, by plotting out the curves and figuring out about when it'll cross over. So there's some time, I mean, I, you know, you're not gonna go out, you're not gonna lose IPv4 tomorrow. You know, this is, this is kind of like the future, when is it coming, talk of, of whatever, but, you know, like with CIDR, the classes under domain routing, you gotta manually renumber your addresses, you know, but now more and more are coming on to this thing. Yeah. Address resolution protocol. 
Okay, the question was, uh, his company's done like 30,000 uh, machine boxes on a NAT, and it works fairly well. Okay, it works better than fairly well. And that what at what point does ARP play into this address resolution protocol? Uh, obviously, with an IP in ARP, you give it an IP and you say, "What's here's this IP address? What's the MAC address?" Is how ARP works in RARP, the Reverse Address Protocol. Here's a MAC address and try to find an ARP. That's how you find. Uh, that's how diskless workstations boot up and stuff like that. Yeah, it probably have to be changed with IPv4. Uh, there's probably an ARP v6. I just haven't uh, messed around with it. Yeah, the, well, yes it will, and you probably could find, yeah, that's probably why they did it, but you take the, uh, yeah, the, the MAC address is theoretically in there. But some people don't have Ethernet. I mean, Token Ring is still out there, and other stuff, such new, you know, type. Token Ring is what? Okay, Token Ring has a MAC address, but is it the same? It's reverse, for, for reverse order? I don't know. Different types of physical layers are go and data link layers, they may have to be converted, they may not. I mean, we could develop a new one tomorrow. Yeah? Are they going to be issuing any numbers? Is there going to be a V6 internet? Or where are you going to get your legitimate V6 address from? The question is, where do I get an IPv6 address from? Is there a NIC that I can go to and, uh, and get an IPv6 address? Uh, my, the University of Virginia Tech was, had, a, uh, had a section, they were on the six bone, you can, uh, I don't think I have an address, that maybe sixbone.net is what was out there and they would allocate you a set of test addresses even now that you could hook up and try to play with. And basically the six bone right now is like ping, can, or it was like the last year or two, can I ping this guy over here, can I get through the routers, can we run router tests, can we do real time video over this, do we need to change this and stuff like that. That. So I would sixbone.net or try to find uh, ietf.org and try to see where that goes to. Yeah. The question is, if you have a toaster and a dishwasher and everything else to the internet, how do you think the ISPs will give you a block of addresses? Is that the question? Or a network? Yeah. Probably what they'll do is they may actually give you a, uh, they, you could probably request, you know, with the different number of networks, I mean an ISP, if you just give them a site level address. And that thing which I put up there is just one particular format. They could say, you're within this southeast region ISP, so we're going to go through and use geographic based addresses, and here's your chunk of your house is on this, is on this, uh, GPS location, so you know everything is going to be on this. I mean, they could do who knows what they could do, but there's different. You know, they could they could aggregate it out. The whole point of using larger and larger addresses is so they could have router inefficiency. So yeah, they could probably give you a thousand addresses and not really, you know, care. Yeah. Right. And then you use slash 64, and your lower 64 bits are essentially guaranteed to be unique throughout the entire internet. Yeah, the question is, is, is so yeah, is that the... Well, that's the way I understood it when I was reading, um, the guy from the back of the other, uh, the little friend at 36 world. Who, Tima? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, If the NLA, if they, if they, the question was, if I have a TLA and an NLA and a, uh, and a format prefixer, and each ISP is given 64 bits, do I have 64 bits that I can play around with? Or if they give me an address, will that be unique? Yes, it'll probably be unique if they use global-based addressing. But uh, it depends on whether they, like a university who's given a TLA and an NLA may say, okay, the computer science department has this S site level aggregator and, and they only need, uh, you know, a million machines. So, you know, we'll only give them this many bits, but the, uh, you know, the biology department may, have, may, may need half of that. So we'll give them a bigger SLA. It depends on how they, they put the SLA in there. The, the, the EUI, the, the interface on the end, the 64 bits, yeah, the 64 bits on the end will be unique. Yeah. because it's based off of your MAC address. 
but the, it depends on how they, yeah, that's right, because the SLA is in the first 64 bits, so it depends on how the ISP gives it out. Yeah, I got, uh, let, me just, let me just finish one more slide here, and then we'll be, and then I'll take questions for the rest of the time. So, you know, <laughs> tools need to be ported. And there's a great, Stevens came out with the next Unix network programming book, and he covers IPv6. How do we program IPv6? BOV6. <laughs> The netcat v3. Bovis, yeah, the bovine, yeah. So, yeah, I have to write Dill on the, and say, yo, Dill, man, why are you bring out BOV6? Because there's not, you know, right now it's so, in such an infancy stage, there's plenty of opportunity out there to play. And there are probably still, there's tons of security flaws out there, I'm sure. They're just getting, you know, they're just kind of getting rolling. And I just kind of just rambled for a few guesses here, and I put some question marks, renumbering, how do you make sure your renumbers are from a correct source if I go from there to here? How do you prevent routers from doing this? How do you prevent machines? Because now I can renumber and say, if I'm in a new network, go, oh, well, yeah, you know, I, I am the router right now. You can send everything through me and have a big black hole. And people have set Windows boxes up wrong in labs that I've been at, and then all of a sudden, you know, where it just kind of comes to them and everything gets routed to them and it doesn't know what to do with it it just drops everything you know mobility the ability to say or in a mobile ad hoc network um, here here I'm the new router for this room I can route everything out because I have a connection out the wall so just send everything to me and there's you know you got to have security for some of these things and that, they'll come around but but things need to be ported tools need to be out there anything that's for IPv4 will be for IPv6 and so there's plenty of stuff out there to do. Yeah, go ahead. So this is where I'll take questions right now. Here, the, Before I take questions, here's the RFCs for, for IPv6, that Bellevin paper I referenced, Bradner's book, and was developed in 96, kind of told like the, the theory, like why we did this. He took the IETF minutes and said, well, why did we decide 128 bits? And why did we do this? That's a good book. It's different essays. Uh, the Deering uh, pro Internet, that's the base IPv6 protocol. That's the Hutima book we were talking about, IPv6. Uh, a paper I ripped a lot of the slides off of. And, uh, and Richard Stevens at Network Programming Books. If you the notes, I guess I'll give them the DT or something like that, but we'll see how it goes. So I guess from now, I've been talking for 50 minutes, so until they kick me out, yeah. Sites with references. Um, IETF.org will have those those refs off of there. The uh, the books and the papers, I guess, look them up in the in the library. Um, six Bone. Some of the sites are listed in some of those papers and books. So I go to those like the, the Lee paper and Hutima probably has some sites in there that you could go play around with and probably download it and install it and get a test address and put yourself on IPv6 and you know, get a million addresses to yourself. Yeah. Uh, let's go with uh, that, that in the back over there. We'll the question is, how do we deal with multi-homing? Because if we put more than, the, the question was, if we put, if I have multi-homed hosts, which multi-homed ho hosts, which are different, Basically, gateways, anything that has more than one, I still got to advertise all of these. Is that right? How, how's the deal with this? That's a question. Um, probably based, I mean, I guess it would be based off those prefixes like like it was down there. I mean, you still have to, you still have to do that, but in order for go to three or four, that slide back, uh, back yonder, hold on. All right, so I'm from the south, all right? Yeah. I guess right here, if you had different, uh, this is, would be some of the ways that things were up. And if I had, if my machine both had prefix 3 and prefix 4, I guess it would go to the nearest one. I, I, I'm not really sure how that would, uh, all this, I guess it would be done off the, off of the variable length subnet masks. Uh, I'm 
not really sure. Anycast, well, Anycast actually does an expanding ring search, and uh, they talk about that in the Lee's paper where you just sit there and try to find out where it, where it goes, and eventually you'll find something. Well, now, that's not like the nearest, that's the nearest is in hops, so it may not be nearest is in geographic, but. As far as broken links going down, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's stuff that can be done with that, but. Okay, if anybody wants a question, I'll be outside. They just said uh, we only have this room till one and they've got to set up for something else. So I'll meet you outside. Thank you.